Welcome. We're going to explain to you what Hello World from Scratch is. So the first question is, we're talking about Hello World from Scratch. So what do we mean when we say from scratch? Well, there's a really famous quote about that, which is from Carl Sagan. And Carl Sagan says, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. So I really like this quote. And if we kind of look at it a little bit deeper, there is a bit more to it than it may first seem. So in general, if we dig a bit deeper, we see it's about how we forget how complex things really are. We look at these systems which we have so much experience with, which we use every day, and they seem like a black box. They seem like, well, it's a simple, you know, we compile, we run. Those are the stages. But we forget how complex these things actually are underneath the hood. And that's what we're going to be talking about, trying to elucidate how your tools are actually working. So let's get started with a simple example. We'll be doing two parts. The first part will be Hello World in C, which we'll be calling C because it's actually just C++, but it's a C subset of it. And the second part will be Hello World in C++ with the actual proper C++ complications that we will hopefully be doing later. So let's start with the simple Hello World. Who in this room has never written Hello World in C? That's one person. I am surprised that you have not done that. So just to give you a small introduction of what Hello World in C looks like, it looks like this. We have a hash include for a function that we will be using to print Hello World. We have a function definition for main, and we'll be using puts because it's simpler than printf. This is our program, and this will be basically the next hour. We have just this program to compile. <laughs> it might be a bit longer than an hour. I'm, I'm underestimating. <laughs> OK. so. This is kind of what a lot of people see when they write C or C++. We have source file right at the top. We have big blob. We have executable. Somewhere in this big blob, there is magic. There is sparkly magic. Sparkly magic. We don't know what's going on in there. It's really complicated. We, do, we don't touch this. We just don't look at this. What if we remove magic? What is, what is that? Well, re in reality, it's just called translation. Translation is the process of having our source file, translating it into an executable, which can then be run on our system. Some people will refer to this as compilation. Compilation is a part of translation, and we'll see how this all fits together. So if you go to the subsystems, we start with a source file. We take the source file and we run it through a preprocessor. And the preprocessor will take whatever's in the source file, it will take all the preprocessor statements, and figure out what to do with them. It will take defines and get rid of them. It will take hash includes and include some source code. And the end of this, we get preprocessed source code. And that is essentially all your compiler will be seeing. It will not look beyond the preprocessed source code. The compiler takes the preprocessed source code, converts it into assembly using a fairly complicated process that we'll be going into detail about. Then we have assembly language output. The assembly language output is still not something your computer will understand. So at this point, we feed that to an assembler. The assembler takes the assembly language input, converts it into an object file, which is a binary representation that's very close to what your computer will be running. But at this point, we are still just working with one source file's output. And in order to have a program to be run, we need to combine it with all the other bits that make it work, like your system library. So we use a tool called a linker to take all that in and process it into an executable, which we can then, all the way at the end of the talk, run. So this is what the entire talk is going to be about, essentially. How do all of these stages work? We know what the inputs are. We know what the outputs are. We know this is all flowing downwards from our source to our executable. What's going on under the hood? How would you write one of these programs? What are the algorithms? What are the technologies which underlie them? So we're going to be kind of going from top to bottom. We're going to make a few passes, because some of these tools are more complex than others. But we'll get there eventually. So we're going to start right at the top with the preprocessor. This is a very simple thing you might see in uh, C or C++ code. We're defining x to be y. Now, the important thing about this, note where this is in the compilation. This is right in the translation, even. This is right at the top, the preprocessor. This has nothing to do with the C++ language, like the core language of types and functions and all of this. The, the preprocessor will just look at source code and 
it will just take whatever is as an input, it will do a, a string wise substitution. So if we take this define x to y, and we go to a slightly more complicated example defining x of a to y, it will not understand what's actually inside. So it will take this x of a and apply it to whatever's inside the a, and it will look at it as if it's just a single token string. Which means that if we have a slightly more complicated example, we use x on an array of int, which is four int. If I look at this as a developer, I will see this is an array of four ints. But if I look at this as a preprocessor, I will be tripping up because there's a comma. And commas are evil. Commas are, commas are separators inside my macro. And my macro is not intelligent enough to figure out that I actually meant array of ints. So at this point, it will just fail because I have provided two arguments, which is array less than int and four greater than, to a macro taking just one argument. Yeah, this is bad. I have my mic back. Fantastic. Yes. Okay. So this would be an error. If we have a macro which is only taking one argument, but preprocessor doesn't understand all the C++ -y stuff we've done and just bails out. We're done. So this is an important thing to understand. The preprocessor is before compilation. It's before we actually get into the C++ language proper. Another thing which we might see are if defs. We have some condition. If def were at ACCU, then hi ACCU, hi everyone. But if you're watching this at home, then we won't say hi person at home. So what the preprocessor will do is literally remove any code which is in the not taken branch. This is the only thing the compiler sees. The compiler does not see this hi person at home. We could put nonsense in here. We could put poetry. We could put a MIDI file in this else block, and the compiler would never see it. It doesn't even need to be text. It could just be a binary blob, and it will just ignore it. As long as it ends with a new line, a hash, and an end if, that's fine. Another thing is includes, and these just say, take this file, which I will find in some implementation defined manner, preprocess that, dump it into my code. So this is, again, it's textual substitution. It's before compilation. It's before we're understanding the structure and semantics of our code. So that's all we're going to say about the preprocessor, because it's not as interesting as some of the rest. Now we're going to get on to the compiler, which is hard and complex and could be many, many, many talks. So we're going to skip over some things, but we want to give you a good overview of how compilers work and what kinds of transformations they do. So if we look at them, look at the compiler in itself, it takes our preprocessed source and outputs assembly. Now, as the compiler is a step in all of this, which we saw, the compiler has a bunch of steps itself. So we can expand it out and split it up into front end, a middle end, and a back end. So what these stages do is the front end takes our source and is then going to output an intermediate representation, usually called IR. Um, why it does this, we'll explain later, but this is essentially the front end is converting to some representation other than source and other than assembly, which the compiler is then going to work on. It's going to optimize it, analyze it in the middle end, and finally, it's going to output some assembly in the back end. So this is all we're going to say about the compiler for now. We'll come back to it after a bit more work. So let's look at the assembler. The assembler takes as the input the assembly that we generated before. And the assembler will be trying to decode your assembly instructions into a binary format that it can put in the object file. So this is what a MIPS instruction might look like. MIPS is a RISC architecture, which means reduced instruction set. It's quite simple. It has few instructions. And the encoding is fairly simple as well. Uh, if we did this for x86, uh, you wouldn't be able to read any of this, because it would be massive and complex. So we're going to stick with MIPS. So the, the goal is to take this textual representation of our instruction, add some registers, store them in another register, and we want to encode this as binary, because our computer cannot understand this text, it only understands binary. So the, the kind of makeup of a MIPS instruction is we have an opcode over the left-hand side, right-hand side. And this tells the computer 
what kind of instruction this is. Is it a arithmetic um, or logic instruction? Is it a branch instruction? All of these kinds of things. Then we have three registers, our two source registers and a destination. We have something which is used for shift or rotate instructions. And finally, a function. This is like add or minus. So what would this look like for our example is our opcode is zero. That means we're going to use the arithmetic and logic unit in MIPS. We have our three register values. These are just the numbers for those three registers. We're not using shifts or rotates, so this is zero. And this says add. This is just the, the function number for add. So we take those numbers and we encode them in binary. And now we have an actual machine instruction, which we can put into our program. Does that all make sense to everyone? Is anyone not following along with this? We can, we can, we're going to go fast as we um, get on as well. So if you want us to repeat anything, please just put your hand up. We also have directives for the assembler. These are kind of instructions which say, OK, assembler, can you please put some space for uh, a global variable here? Or um, please take this string and stick it somewhere in our binary. And so the assembler is going to understand this. It's going to allocate some space for, um, for this variable, four bytes. It's going to make sure that it's aligned, because MIPS requires aligned loads. And it's going to store it in our dot data section. So what we mean when we talk about sections is that means we're talking about the ELF format at this point. And ELF is the format that we will be using to output our binary bits that we get from the assembler into a format that we can input into a linker. It's basically just a container that allows you to put in some binary blobs and give it a bit of information, just enough to explain to the linker what it actually means. And an ELF file starts with an ELF header, a program header or a section header and some actual bytes that make up the contents of your ELF file. There are four different kinds of ELF files. So there's an object file, which is the stuff between the, uh, the assembler and the linker. There's an executable, which is the stuff that your linker outputs. There's a shared library, which is also something that your linker will output, except that it's something that's slightly more complicated. It's the second part of the talk. And there's a core dump, which is something that your executable will output in case you do something horribly wrong and have turned on core dumps. And these are all encoded in ELF. So the object file is just a part of your program in some tiny bits. The executable is a whole program, as much as we can put in one bit. And the crash dump is your whole program as a crash. So now we have our object file. Presumably, we actually have multiple object files. Um, and we want to link these together into one final executable. And that's the process which the linker is going to do. So the linker is going to start by taking all of your object files that you pass in. And you're going to pass in all the object files that should make up your program, all the ones that you must include for it to be your program. And it's going to take those, load them all in, and create a lookup table of all the symbols that exist and that are referenced inside it. But it's going to find that some symbols don't exist. And for those, it will know that I need to get them somewhere. It's going to go through whatever you pass in next, which will be a bunch of libraries. It's going to load through those libraries and find out which of these libraries contains an object file that does define this symbol. And then it's going to take that object file out of the library, load it in, append it to whatever we have, and go back. And this may introduce new symbols that are not being found. So we'll recursively keep going on and on and on until we found all the things that we need to have for your executable to be complete. As soon as we've done that, we will take all the undefined references that we have in the code, the relocations, and we'll change them to point to the actual variables and actual code that we loaded. At that point, we have actual code that is runnable. It doesn't contain undefined references. So at that point, we take what we've made in the linker, we take it all, dump it into an executable file, and we are done. Yep, so we will have a full run through of what a linker does later, but it's a lot of bytes and scary stuff, so we're, we're going to skip that just for now. Just do keep in mind that when we are going back to the linker, at that point, everything will be bytes. So they will not be very readily understood. It will not be easily read. And we will be going through it fairly quickly. So if you don't follow all the mathematics in hex, that's fine. It's just meant as an introduction showing that everything does go from assembly into the executable. So I want to come back to the compiler. 
This is my favorite part of the entire stage of translation. I spent a lot of my life working on compilers, and they're amazing. So we expanded our compiler earlier, and we saw that it had a middle end, and a front end, and a back end. So we're going to go through these in different stages, and we're going to go deeper. Our front end is made up of different stages. Now, this is as deep as we're going to go. We're not going to get into full inception territory. But essentially, we have four main stages of the front end. The front end, remember, is taking our pre-processed source and outputting an intermediate representation. And the four stages it goes through are lexing, which will translate our source to a series of tokens, which is essentially just an easier way for our compiler to understand our source code. We're then going to parse this into a big tree, which we can then traverse, analyze it, make sure our program actually makes sense, it type checks. And finally, we're going to actually generate our intermediate representation from this tree. Now, I'm going to step through all of these different stages, starting with Lexing. So in Lexing, we are going to look at source code basically in the same way that a human would. When I'm looking at this, I don't see a 0, a 1, a 0, a 0, a 1, a 0, a 0, and a 1. I'm seeing an I. I'm seeing the word int. So at this point, we're going to be taking it from source encoding and from bytes into some kind of useful form that sort of represents how we read code. And to do that, we need to look at the source code in the same way that a human does, which means that we're going to be dealing with white space. We're going to be dealing with identifiers that we've not seen before. We're going to be dealing with strings, like hello world, which contains a space which is not a white space, it's a part of a string. We're going to be dealing with punctuation. How do we deal with a right shift operator or maybe two uh, closing brackets? And we're going to be dealing with multiple, multiple character operators. And all of this stuff is done in the, in the tokenizer, in the lexer. So to start, we're going to look at the first thing that we find, which is int. Int is an ID. We're going to be looking at what comes next. It's a space. Space does nothing, we skip the space. Then we get an M. We know it's going to be an ID, so we parse until we get the ID. Then we go to the next thing, which is a single parenthesis. For the, for the grammar later on, for the parsing, it's relevant that we have these two separate, so we just pass on this as a left parenthesis. I'm not sure why it's a left parenthesis, not an open parenthesis. <laughs> for some reason, everybody just calls it left. And then at that point, we continue with the same thing on and on until we've uh, tokenized the entire source file which gets us this list of tokens. So now we have our list of tokens. Does the lexing kind of make sense to everyone? Does anyone have any questions at this stage? Because we're now going to be using all these tokens, so you kind of need to understand what's been going on. But yeah, question? So the, the question was, are the names of all of these defined by the language? Um, no, these are just generally an implementation-specific thing. This is like our compiler's internal representation of these tokens. Um, so it's, it's probably based off of, um, I mean, it's definitely based off like the language um, syntax, but it's our own internal representation. The thing that we do try to do is sort of use the same kind of names that other Lexus use so that people that read Lexus for a habit, they sort of understand what we're trying to do. And the things that we're trying to do is make sure everything is in a system, everything is short enough to be readable, and everything is long enough to be clear. So that's why we have L parent and not left parent, and why we have semi instead of semicolon. Yep, so these are the kinds of things, if you read other parsers, they will output stuff pretty similar to this. <laughs> so if we're implementing a lexer, we, we just kind of walked through um, an understanding of a human, like we, we see int, we see main. This is kind of obvious to us because we're good at pattern recognition. But how do we actually tell a computer uh, this int is a token, this main is a token, this left paren is a token? So there are a bunch of different ways to implement it, but usually it essentially comes down to a state machine, a finite state automata. This is usually how these things are represented. So if we have our initial state, this is where we've, we've not done any work yet. We're just starting to look at our source. And if we're trying to recognize the tokens A, B, and A, C, not A, D, not B, C, that's all like bad input. We just want to recognize these two tokens. 
Then if we read an A, we go into this state. Then if we read a B, we go into the AB state. If we read a C, we go to the AC state. So you can look at this as a small program that starts here. And while we get a character, we see if it's an A, we go there. And then if we get a next character, it's, an a, it's a B, then we parse AB. We emit an AB token and we go back to the start. And we can implement it quite close to that by implementing it in C++ code. So while we should keep going, we get a character. If it's an A, then we get another character. If it's a B, we push a token, we go back to the start. If it's a C, we push a token, we go back to the start. Omit it are tens or, tens or hundreds of lines of error handling in case it's anything else than this. Yeah, so this is very much a slide where lexer, but it kind of gives the, the idea. Uh, another way of doing it, instead of writing all of this by hand, it's, it's kind of mechanical in a lot of ways. Like it's, um, you can kind of see how given what we want to lex, we can construct these things without too much thought. So we can actually generate them using some tools. Um, a popular one is flex. You have on the left hand side, right hand side, left hand side, Left hand. <laughs> I should just like stand like this. It's, it's left. Yeah, left. On the left hand side, we have uh, what we are trying to recognize, A, B, or A, C. And on the right hand side, we have what we're going to do if we see those tokens. So we have a tool which is going to take this representation, transform it into some code, which will do essentially the same as this. And the reason to do this is because this is a simple example. This is just two simple tokens, and our handwritten version is already fairly complicated to put on a slide. But what happens if we have a more complicated language, such as this one? In which case, we have identifiers, digits. Don't try and read this. This is still relatively simple compared to some grammars, like floating point numbers and things that we have to parse for C++. And this is the reason why using a tool like Flex or Lex is a very good idea for these. Even then, some people still write them by hand, because in that case, you do have just a little bit more control over things. And we'll get to that more in parsing as well, which is what comes next. So now we have our tokens. We have written our uh, hand-rolled lexer, or we've used a tool to generate one for us. And now we want to parse this. We want to understand the structure of the program, not just a bunch of different tokens in a big straight line. So we go on to the parser. And the parser is going to look at this, and it's going to be applying some rules. And in order to be able to define rules, we need to define a grammar for rules. And there's a standard for defining grammars, which is EBNF, or Extended Bacchus Noor Form, or Bacchus Naur Form, one of I those. I actually don't know. We'll just call it Bacchus Noor Form. <laughs> and Bacchus Noor Form, defined in itself, starts with a definition, which is a name followed by double colon equals and a body. So if we have something, double colon equals, the parts that make it, with perhaps a literal dot at the end. If we have repetition that starts with a bracket op and an open brace, something to be repeated, and then a closing brace. If something needs to be optional, zero or one time, then we have an opening bracket, something in between it, and a closing bracket. And the result of that is a language for grammars. Or it could be a flexible language for grammars. Or, or it could be a very, 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 very flexible language. So you can see how we can kind of take this um, representation of what our language should look like, and then by um, expanding these rules, repetition, optionality, we can have more complex um, series of tokens which make up our language. So at this point, we're going to ask you to take your phone or laptop, download the ISO 14882 specification, preferably the latest. Appendix A will contain all 600 rules that we'll need for the rest of the talk. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Okay. Uh, In case you don't feel like reading the entire language specification for just this talk, we have a, a shortened, simplified version, which is going to be just this. So this is sort of a subset of what C++ is. It is very simplified and is much cut down as, in order to be able to explain it. But it is complete enough to parse everything that we have. So at the top, we have type, which is an ID of int. At the bottom, we have name, which is an ID of something else, anything not in, at this point. They could be something else. In the case of type, we could have some other kind of types. We're not going to elaborate because we just need int. In case of statement, we have an expression followed by a semicolon. And there are other statements that we are not going to go into. We have an expression. 
which is part of the statement. And an expression is, for example, a name followed by an opening parenthesis, and then one exp expression followed by zero or more comma expressions, i.e. arguments. And then we have a closing parenthesis. That would be an expression. A second option would be for an expression to just be a string. A literal is an expression at this point. And then we can take those things, put them into a function, and a function is a type followed by a name, left parenthesis, any kind of argument declarations, right parenthesis, left brace, followed by zero or more statements, followed by a right brace. Yeah, so, so using this, we can continue to actually parse it. Yeah, so this is all we need in order to describe the language we're parsing, and we can actually apply all of these rules to generate our syntax tree. So this is, again, our series of tokens. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we see our IDs. We have our ID main, ID int, ID puts. We want to try and work out what these are. Unfortunately, we have some nice grammar rules which tell us. We know that um, if it's an ID int, then it's a type. And we know if it's some other ID, then it's a name. Make sense? So we can expand this. Now we know that. We have a type, id int, a name, id main, a name, id puts. So now we want to do some more work. We can recognize that we have a function. We have a type, a name, arguments, statements. And we can apply this rule to recognize that our entire int main puts thing was a function. So now we have function up at the top left. Got it right this time. Up at the top left. And you see how this is starting to kind of pull over to the right. We're starting to have a little bit of structure built into what was previously a straight line of tokens. Next, we can recognize that we have a statement. This was our, our put statement with a semicolon. So we can shift this over to the right. Now we have a nice statement. <laughs> Even more structure. Expression. Our function call was an expression. Now this is an expression, more structure. This is how the algorithm works. Notice that the semicolon is still part of this statement while all the parentheses and everything inside it is part of the expression. So we are sort of starting to pull everything apart into its constituent parts. And there's just one step left to go, which is that we have a string, which is not something we can give to a, to a function call. We have to give it an expression. So we'll go one step further and parse this string with the same rule into an expression and end up with our full tree which is an expression of hello world, pass the puts into a statement, put into a function. Now, this is not how trees normally grow. I mean, we have the, the top of the tree on the left, or actually the root. And in biology, we have trees which grow from the bottom. But we don't do biology in CS. Our trees go from the top. So if we take this entire thing and rotate it about 90 degrees, we'll get it this. Yep, so this is pretty much a tree, a structured representation of our program text. We have taken what was text, bytes sitting on our file system, we've changed it into a big series of tokens, and now we've understood the structure. We've actually like comprehended something about a program. We have told a program how to comprehend a program. It's pretty cool. <laughs> And so you can see we have a function at the top. It has a return type, name, arguments, statements. If we had more statements, it would be hanging off that uh, statements node. So you can see how this thing can kind of build up. And we know how to deal with trees in computer science. We have hundreds, thousands of algorithms for dealing with trees and manipulating them and traversing them. So this turns out to be a really nice way of representing our program. So similarly to how we showed you kind of how the lexer works through everything and then showed you how to implement one, I'm going to do the same with the parser. And similarly to how you can write something which will generate a lexer for you, you can write something like this, which can be fed into a tool, and you'll get a parser out at the end. And this is fairly, fairly expressive, I think. Does, do people like understand what this is doing? This is just, we have a selection statement, and a selection statement is either an if with an expression statement and an else, or it's an if without an else, or it's a switch statement. This is actually uh, from a full C parser. Like, this is, this is a real thing. This isn't a dumbed-down example for slides. 
you can actually use this to make a C parser. That's a very small part of one, but a part of a real parser nonetheless. Um, similarly to how you could write a lexer with switch statements, you can write a parser using what's called recursive descent. So say we're going to do the same thing. We want to have, we want to hand write some code which is going to do the same as this. So we're going to start off, we want to parse a selection statement. So first we're going to get the next token to check if we have an if statement or a switch. And say, okay, what if we have an, an if statement? Our next token was an if. We're going to try and parse the expression, the condition, which tells us whether to take the branch or not. We're going to parse any statements which were inside that if block. Oops. And then we're going to make this into a node of our graph and return it out. And of course, we should be dealing with the else, and the switch will be somewhere down here, but slides. Um, so you can see how this is, this is called recursive descent because we are, we're, we're parsing a selection statement here, and then we're parsing an expression, we're parsing a statement, maybe somewhere down here, when, while we're parsing our statement inside our if, we find another if, and we have to come back in and parse another selection statement. So this kind of builds up the same tree representation by delving right down into the code, recursing, and just making everything explicit. So you can achieve essentially what you can with the parser generator with the handwritten code. But it might not be obvious, like, why, we, why would you do this if you could just write the, the simple um, parser generator version? And I think some of the, some of the reasons are, if you, if you write a generator, it's really fast to get started. You know, the, the representation I had of, um, of selection statements was like four lines of code or something. It was fairly easy to understand. You can get going, you can get something working. And the, the tools which will generate a parser for you are fairly um, good at generating efficient ones as well. It will generate essentially just a big table of values and some driver code to run over this table. Um, it's fairly efficient. You also, the best thing almost is you get your grammar checked for you. So if you have some ambiguous rules, and we'll see one very shortly, then your tools can tell you about it. The alternative to making something with a generator is to do it entirely handwritten. So like the thing we had on the previous slide, we can do this for the entire grammar. It sounds like a crazy idea to do this for something like C++, but as far as I know, Nearly all good C++ parsers are actually handwritten and not done with a generator. They're easier to handle, they're easier to report errors, because you know exactly what you have, you can just modify it like it's code, because it actually just is code. It is much easier to debug, because when something goes wrong and you get an exception somewhere or a message, you have code you can just step into, instead of going into a generic handler that will be at some point inside the table looking at a different part of the table that are just essentially bits to you. And it rep represents some of the rules you put in, but there's no way to get back to the original text to understand what's actually going wrong. And they can write a very friendly parser with enough work. You can make it very nice, you can make it handle errors, you can make it give really, really detailed, colorful error messages, point, pinpointing exactly where something went wrong and how it's gone wrong. But to get back to the grammar check a bit, because there was a, a, a conflict on one of the slides already, which was this one. If I put in this statement at the bottom, I have an if A, then if B, let's put some value, else put some, some other value. Now it's not clear from the grammar, so if I'm looking at this, I wouldn't necessarily expect this right away, but if I'm looking at this from a programmer point of view, I have two if statements and I have one else. So to which of these does the else actually go? If I put this into a grammar generator, a parser generator, it will read my grammar, it will tell me I have a shift reduce conflict. Because it could either parse the second line or the first line depending on whether or not this if statement should take the else or not. There are ways to explain how to deal with ambiguities like that, and there are a lot of failures that you can put into your grammar that it will just find and tell you you messed up. Instead of going all the way to making the implementation of the parser, running it on a bunch of test examples, and then finding out that actually 
my grammar is just messed up and it doesn't work and I need to go back to scratch and do the entire thing again. Yeah, so my personal recommendation, um, if you're wanting to get build a good parser, use a tool like Antlerworks or something for actually generating your grammar because you get all this checking stuff and then handwrite it. Take your grammar and convert it into handwritten code because then you get the benefits of the grammar checking and you get the benefits of better error messages, more debuggability. This is the way which I go when I'm writing parsers. I don't know if you're the same. I would do the same thing. Try to get it validated automatically and then try to handwrite it. Also note the, the sort of programmer humor in that because we started with a yak, which is yet another compiler compiler, parser generator. And then somebody said, we need to make a better yak, so we're going to make a bison, which is like a yak, but better. <laughs> and then somebody said, well, bison is all good and friendly, but we need something that is similar, like part of a bison. So we're going to call it antler, which is part of a bison. <laughs> yeah, programmer is the worst. Anyway, yes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So we had our parser. Um, does anyone want us to go back over any of that? Because that was a lot of information. Any questions at this point? Yes? Um, our parsers are only also state machines. Uh, I don't really want to get into different kinds of grammars. I was thinking about the exact same thing. So the thing is that Alexa is a level two uh, language and a parser does a level three language which is allowing it to do more complicated things like recursion, keeping state of uh, many things, which means that it's not quite as easy as Alexa. So it is not a state machine, but it resembles one in many ways. Yeah, and depending on, there are different kinds of grammars which can represent more complex languages, and depending on uh, how your grammar is built, you'll need to use different um, generation um, methods to actually be able to parse that grammar. So some, not all grammars are created equal, essentially. So some are more complex than others. We can go into detail, but we'll do that after the talk if you're interested. Yeah, come talk to us about um, different kinds of grammars afterwards. Any other questions? Cool. Semantic analyzer. Anal an analyzer? Semantic analyzer. analyzer. So we've got our AST now. And we now want to analyze it. We know about the structure, but we don't know what it means. This code, does it mean anything? Can somebody tell us what this does? Any hands? Chris? So okay. that, that is the, the kind of low-level semantics of what's happening, but the high-level semantics is it does nothing. I mean, the, there's, there's no meaning to this program. It doesn't accomplish anything. In the end, it returns zero, but if I didn't have this line in there, it would also be returning zero. But what about this very, very similar line? What does this do? Anybody? Doesn't compile. Of course it does not compile, because we're trying to put a string into an int. And strings or int are different things, they don't work. But in terms of the parser, up to this point, we just had a type, a name, equals an expression. And this is also type, name, equals expression. They are the same thing up to this point. So we need something to tell us this is wrong and this is right. 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 <laughs> yeah, so this is what semantic analysis is about. We know the... Um, in this example, it's valid. This example is not valid, even though it's grammatically the same. And how this is done is we take our abstract syntax tree and we traverse over it, working out what the types are, checking them against each other, um, annotating our source so that later on, when we come to doing code generation, optimizations, and things like that, we understand more about our program. Um, a lot of those things are not particularly interesting, so we're going to kind of scoot over semantic analysis. Note that the input to the semantic analysis is an AST, and the output is again an AST. It's the same kind of thing, but the thing is that in the annotated AST, we know that it sort of complies with all the rules, which means that in the code generation, we can assume that we have sensible same things, and before that point, we could not. Yeah, and there's also the fact that most of the compiler errors you get are due to semantic analysis. Anything which says these types didn't match is because the compiler has analyzed the semantics and said that your program is not valid. 
If you say like missing a semicolon, that's in the parsing stage. If it's something about the meaning of your program, then it's in the semantic analysis stage. So after we've analyzed our program, we've lexed it, we've parsed it, we've analyzed it, we're down to the bottom level, which is code generation. So I promised that we'd talk a bit about intermediate representation because it's not immediately obvious why you would have one. But say we're writing a C++ compiler, someone else is writing a Rust compiler, someone else is writing a Swift compiler, and we all want to target x86, ARM, MIPS, PowerPC, whatever. We need to do a lot of work because we need to write code to generate x86 from C++, we need to generate code to generate ARM from C++ and MIPS, then the Rust people need to do the same thing, and then the Swift people need to do the same thing. There's a lot of edges to this graph, and each edge represents like man or person decades of work. Just imagine that we are continuing on to the right because we have Kotlin, we have uh, R, we have C, we have Java. We just want to add more languages and more supported backends. And in this case, the amount of work that we need to do is quadratic. What if we could just simplify that a bit? So we just stick something in the middle here, intermediate representation. We've minimized the work we have to do by a huge amount. Now, if I want to write a C compiler, a C++ compiler, which targets x 6 ARM, and MIPS, I just need to do one thing, compile from C++ to IR. I mean, obviously that's not simple, but it's way simpler than writing x86 ARM and MIPS backends for your own compiler. So somebody was really clever a, a couple of years ago, did the, the same thing at this point, and realized that if you have an IR do, doing x86 ARM and MIPS, you can package that and call it LLVM. <laughs> and then we'll just give LLVM, which has no same language in front of it, and we'll let people write front ends for it. So we'll call a front end Clang. So this is how you get Clang slash LLVM as a single compiler, because both parts of it are separate projects, and the combination of both gives you a C++ compiler to x86. Even better is if the Rust people um, have a look at the x86 backend for LLVM and say, oh, hey, I got some, some bad optimization here. Um, I'm going to go fix it. Then we as C++ compiler vendors get the benefit for free. We didn't have to do any work. Our compiler's better. And in case you're one of the very, very crazy people who decides to just go and write and invent your own new language, you can write just a front end and feed it into the IR, and then you get all the back ends for free. Yep. And all the optimizations, all the analysis, everything will be done for you. So this kind of model is really nice in terms of just programming language community and how we can all benefit from each other and work together to create better languages and better systems. Yes? Yes, that's a really good question. So the, the question was, are there um, optimizations which are specific to different languages? Absolutely, yes. So things like, I'll touch a little bit on this later, but um, so C++ has virtual functions. Not all languages have virtual functions. Um, but C++ compilers can try and work out, oh, this, uh, this variable, although it's like dynamically allocated and it's, um, is some derived class of something, I know what it is at compile time, and I don't have to make virtual function calls. I can resolve these at compile time. So that's called devirtualization, and it's something which um, I know compilers like GCC have done a huge amount of work on, on devirtualization recently, and it's pretty much C++ specific. I mean, there are other languages which have virtual functions and things like that, but this kind of thing is very C++ specific. So that's a, an example of a, a language specific optimization. A different thing that you would get for Rust is that it has a borrow checker, which means that it knows much more about lifetime than we can even express in C++. And by putting that information into the IR, there will be some optimizations that work well on Rust generated IR that will work badly on C++ generated IR. So while the optimization isn't technically restricted to Rust, it is effectively for Rust only until we can make it output things that the IR contains enough information so that it can do those optimizations on C++ as well. Maybe needing some modifications in the language, like const, deval, or some other things that we don't know about. Cool. So this is our 
kind of bizarrely shaped AST, and we now need to generate our intermediate representation from it. Okay, so let's start by taking what we have. We have a function with some arguments, but there aren't actually any arguments. And in the IR, we don't necessarily need to know if there's no arguments because we'll just ignore them anyway. So let's get rid of that. Now we have a function that has some contents. It has a statement. But the function is a tree construct, and we need to make it into a linear construct for IR. So the first thing we're going to do is take the function, throw away the return type, because the semantic analysis already guaranteed that everything up to this point is sane. We're just going to ignore the return type and synthesize whatever the code outputs. So we're going to take this name and put it into main. And we have a function main in IR with a whole bunch of contents that are still in tree form. We have an opening brace and a closing brace. Those are sort of still in the tree form, but we kind of need them for a tiny detail all the way at the end. Now let's take the final bit of tree that we have. We have a statement with an expression with another expression. We're going to take the deepest bit, which is the bottom expression. We're going to take it out and give it a name. We're going to call it R0. We have R0, which is the expression resulting in a string. Then we're going to take the deepest expression again and basically flatten the tree into just whatever things come in order. We're going to call the first one R0, then we're going to get R1, which is the expression calling puts, and then we have a statement, which is using the return value of puts and then just putting a semicolon behind it. So now we're going to take all of these bits and we're going to convert them to actual IR. We have R0, and that is a string. So we're just going to say R0 is the string. We have R1, which is an expression calling a name, which is puts, and then passing in as a parameter R0. We're going to be shortening that to an IR notation, which is just call puts with R0. And then we have a statement, which is the return value of puts, and then we do nothing with that. So we can just replace that by doing nothing with that, just discarding it. But in computers, we don't even need to discard something, because if it's in memory, if it, or if it's in a register, and we aren't using it, it's effectively discarded already. So we can just ignore discarding it and just not do anything. So at this point, we have essentially everything in IR form, except for the opening and closing brace. The opening and closing brace in this case are for the function. And the function needs to construct a stack frame. The stack frame is the bit of memory reserved for whatever my function needs to store locally. So in case we need to store the string locally, we, locally we'll put it in a stack frame. And an L brace will convert to setting up our stack frame. The closing brace will be converted into removing the stack frame again. And that gets us a nice symmetry. We set up a stack frame, remove it, we have a nice function. And at this point, we get one of the very few bits of magic that C++ does which is that I will have a return zero, which my code doesn't have. This is explicitly in the standard that says if you have a function called main and it doesn't have a return statement, then there's a return zero. So we'll just sort of magically make this. And at this point, we have IR. We can take this, put it into remaining IR steps. Yep, and this is like if you dump out LLVM IR or something, it looks fairly similar to this. Yes, something. How can you, so we, we had, the question is, um, we, we had um, knowing that certain things were functions and strings, how did we know that? That's through the semantic analysis, because we, we, we looked at the IR, we built up all this information about our types, um, so we know what types things are at this stage, so we can say, okay, I know this is a function, so we have to output our call there. Does that answer the question? Cool. Yeah, so if you dump our LLVM IR, it looks Pretty similar to this. Um, there's a few more annotations, a bit more noise, but it's pretty much understandable. And that actually brings us to the end of our front end. So that was a lot of work, but we took some source code and we changed it into immediate, intermediate representation, which is essentially just another kind of source code. But in doing so, we lowered the level of abstraction down to something which is quite close to assembly. And that's actually gonna help us a lot as we go further. And any questions on the front end before we move on? Cool. Middle end. So the middle end is a little bit maybe less well defined where it actually sits, but I'm going to call it as the middle end is doing analysis and target independent optimizations, 
which means optimizations which um, it doesn't matter if I'm targeting x86 or ARM or whatever, these are going to be valid. Things like eliminating dead code. It doesn't matter what architecture I'm going to run it on. If it's dead code, it's dead code. I can just remove it. So that's going to happen in the middle end. In the LLVM example, this is part of LLVM, and Clang would be just the front end. So one thing is, is liveness analysis. So this is an, an, I'm going to give a few examples. Um, one example of analysis, one example of optimization, just so you can get a feel for what's going on. There's like hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of, of analyses and optimizations. So I'm just going to pick two to give you a taste. And liveness analysis is one which says, when are variables live? When in my source code, if I have some variable, and maybe after some point, it's still in scope, but I'm not using it. Can I optimize based on that? Can I make any decisions based on knowing when things are alive? So let's start with a simple code example. But first, we need to understand what liveness yes. analysis is trying to achieve. Yes. And so there are two things we want to know from liveness analysis. The live outs, which is after a given instruction or block of instructions, what variables are live afterwards. And the live ins, what was um, valid before this. And there's an algorithm which will work this out for us. So for a given instruction i, the live outs are whatever was alive for all its successors. The successors being the next instructions. So if it's just an add, it will be the next instruction down. If it's a branch, then it could be an instruction over there. If it's a conditional branch, it could be one over there and one over there. Like this kind of thing. Any successors, any possible places the instruction could get to next, what was alive going into there. And our live ins are the same as the live outs, but we remove anything we assign to in the instruction and we add anything we use. So I'm going to go run through an example of this. Uh, I find this a lot more of an understanding, uh, understandable description than what I was given um, at uni, which was this. This is completely accurate, and this is a technically correct and functionally correct, completely closing definition of it. But as far as I can tell, I, I have a hard time reading this, and the previous description for me is 10 times easier. And I haven't met anybody who prefers the mathematical one, although I'm sure they exist. Yep, so we're going to use the textual one, and we're going to use it on this symbol code. So we have variables we're assigning, the numbers are just garbage. But we're assigned to E, A, B. Um, we call some functions with B and A. We assign them to D and C and D. And then we call some functions with F, D and C. This is basically a constructed example. And the first thing we're going to do is take this and take it apart into uh, bits of code that are essentially completely separate by either assigning or using something. So we're going to take these two statements apart and expand them into the calculation and the assignment, and then the calculation and the assignment. And at this point, we've removed the numbers because they're completely irrelevant. We just have assignments, use, assign, use, assign, use. So we might as well replace this, which is still sort of like the code, with an annotation that says this is the definition of something, and this is the use of something. So we have definitions and a use, and definition and a use. And then we do our algorithm from the bottom. Yep, so liveness analysis works from the bottom, the very last instruction, all the way back up to the top. So I'm going to put our definition back on so we can work out where we're going. And I can run over this multiple times. So we start right at the bottom. Our outs are the live ins of any successors. Well, we're the last instruction. We don't have any successors. So out is the empty set. Make sense? OK. So our ins are the same as our outs, but we take away anything we define, and we add anything we use. Well, we're using C. So that's going to be added to our ins. So our in is the set just containing C, and our outs is the empty set. Does anyone want me to explain that again? No. OK, cool. then we'll go to the next one. On the line above this, we have the outputs, which is the same as the inputs for the next line. So we take this, copy paste it over. We have the outs being C. On this line, we are using D, which means that at this point of use, D would have to be defined. So in the inset, we take whatever we have out, and we add the things that we are using, which is D. 
We remove anything that we are assigning, but in this case, we're not assigning, so we get C and D. And then on our next line, we're finally defining something. So again, our outs are just a copy of the next one's in. If this was a more complex example with branches, it wouldn't be so easy, but for this example, we can just copy up, essentially. And our ins are the same as our outs, but we take away anything we define, we add uses. We're not using anything, we're defining D, so we take away D. The reason why we're taking away D is because if at this point D had a value, it would be irrelevant because we are not going to use this value anymore from this point on. So anything before this that is not using that value of D shouldn't see it as being in use. Yep, so then we can pretty much just continue up in the same way, copy across, add our use, copy across, take away our define, copy across, add our use, and all the way back up until we're left with nothing. Does anyone want me to rerun that, or are we okay? So everybody following the stuff that we have on the right side right now. Does anybody see the letter E on the right side, by the way? Yeah, there's I'm, no, I'm not seeing that. Yeah, there's no instance of E at all. So based on our analysis, we can optimize. So this is something called dead store elimination. We defined, we assigned to E, we stored something, but we never used it, so there's no point ever doing that thing, so we can remove it. So this is, we've done some analysis, and based on our analysis, we've gained more of an understanding of our program, and we've optimized it. We're gonna see more of liveness analysis later, so all of that wasn't just for removing a single instruction, but this is one of the things we can do based on um, what's called uh, data flow analysis, of which liveness is one of those. One of the most important bits that we get out of this is having the same IR that we had before, but now we have more information attached to it that explains things to us that we can use in later stages to either make better decisions, to make more informed decisions, or to be able to just use this as an input instead of the IR because we just need this output. Yep, so that's all we're going to say about the middle end for now. Oh, yeah, sorry, question. Um, if, there's, if there's no effect to the, um, if you're not doing anything which is affecting the liveness of the variables, then you still need to make sure you percolate up the liveness information from below because you need to know if you're eventually going to use, like if I, if I use A here and I have a bunch of stuff um, which is intervening, I still need to know up here that I'm using A so that I have the correct information about the liveness of the variable, because I, I need to know that somewhere down here, A is still alive because I use it. Does that make sense? Yes. So the liveness analysis is all from the bottom up. So all this analysis, yep. The dead store elimination in this case is the one that's looking at this information and deciding that E is a dead store, so therefore we can remove it. There are a whole lot of things you can do in this stage, and I think this is still the main place in compiler design where there's a whole lot of research going on. So if you'd like to go for a PhD in compiler design, you would be working on this middle end. And in case of LLVM and GCC, if you have a reasonably complex program, this will be 90% plus of where your compile time will be going especially when we got modules, then the preprocessor and the first steps are going to be easier. So this will be even more. So then we get to the back end. Yep, so we've optimized our IR, and now we want to output our assembly. And again, we have more levels. So I've not put arrows between these, because some of these might occur a number of times, like you might optimize at a few stages. Um, but these are essentially the main things which have to occur in the back end of a compiler. So we're going to walk through them. Instruction selection. I have some, some C code. We have two pointers to ints, and we add the values stored there and store it into v0. All good? It's reasonably understandable C code, and we can generate some IR from it. Now this is just a, it's more verbose, but it's telling us exactly what's happening. We're loading from v0, we're loading from v1, we're adding the results of that and storing it back into v0. 
I can probably get you some x86 instructions for that. In case somebody's more familiar with assembler than IR, you can basically do it like this. We take the value from RSI, which is our second argument, put it into EX. Take the value from RDI, first argument, put it into EBX, add the two together, and then store it back into RSI. Yep, so this is called macro expansion. When we look at each instruction in turn, and we decide what is the, for our target, which in this case is x86, how can I represent this IR instruction? Now it might be that um, one IR instruction has to take multiple assembly instructions. And in this case, although everything is only taking one instruction, it's not as efficient as it could be. In this case, we're looking at x86 code, and x86 is not a RISC processor, in which case you would have separate stores, you would have separate loads, and you would have instructions that do something that will never have a store or load built into them. In case of x86, though, we see that we have a load from RSI, which is a memory location, then we add a value to it, and then we store it back into the same memory location. And in fact, we're not using it after, so there's no value in putting it into a register. So what if we first load a value, and then add into that. And I think that we've made a technical mistake in having the wrong instruction there. Sorry. Yep, it's my that fault. happens. Uh, so in this case, we can optimize it to two instructions, where the first one should have been moving from RDI and the second one should have been adding to RSI, but excuse the, uh, the slight mistake. In this case, the two instruction version would be the same speed. It would be effectively much more compact because we just have two instructions to encode instead of four. Yep, so this process of after we've done our macro expansion, we've decided, looked at some instructions and collapsed them down. This is called peephole optimization. So this is a kind of target specific optimization which is happening after our instruction selection. So this is one approach to instruction selection, just expanding everything and then hoping the optimizer cleans up. Another possibility is um, what LLVM uses, and that's selection DAGs, where DAG means directed acyclic graph. So what we do is we take our code and we represent it as a graph again. You may notice that like 90% of compilers is just graphs. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of graphs in compilers. We like graphs. In this case, we would be seeing that we have a load from V0, add to it, and then store it to V0. If we had a proper DAC, this would actually point to the same V0. But if we realize that, then we can just map this entire subgraph of the DAG and map it to a single instruction. So we're going to mark that. This is going to be one instruction based on our subgraph, subgraph match. And we'll generate it into a instruction, which is adding into our target V0 from some register. We'll just pick EAX. And then we have the remaining tree, which will map to a second instruction which is going to be, again, of EAX, RSI. So now we have the same instructions coming out in a different way. Yep, so there's no right way of doing this. This is one approach. Macro expansion is another approach. Um, if you want to see how LLVM actually does this, you can build a debug build and pass minus debug, and it will tell you like everything it does and all of the selection DAG matching. It's pretty cool. If I think I have a weird own, definition of cool, but... If you're trying to make your own compiler, it's probably easier to use the macro expansion, just yeah. generate some bad code and sort of hope that you can patch it up reasonably, because that's a much simpler approach, but this one is much more powerful and will give you better code. So after we've selected our instructions, we need to schedule them. Um, so what I mean by this is processors are complicated. Um, processors have big pipelines, processors do ridiculous things under the hood, and we want to make sure that our instructions are ordered such that they will run as fast as possible. To give a real-world example of that, suppose you're making pasta and sauce. The thing I tend to do is go to, go to the uh, refrigerator, get the stuff for the sauce, cut it all up, put it into bits, turn on the heat, make the pasta sauce, realize I forgot to put it on the water, get some water, put it on the stove, and then go and sit on my phone and play games for 15 minutes. Yep, so Peter if had I had done my instruction stall. scheduling better, I would have started by taking the water, putting that on the heat, and then doing everything else, because that avoids a whole lot of latency and waiting. And my CPU is no different from that. Yep, so that's essentially what pipeline stall is. Tried to do something, realized they had a de dependency, had to wait on, and stall, stop doing something. Go sit on your phone and play around for a bit, except for the CPU equivalent of that. Yep. So if we have an example like this, where we add um, 
R9 to R8, and then add R10 to R8. We need to wait for the previous instruction to finish before we can do the next one uh, in a simplified CPU. Uh, real CPUs nowadays do like out of order execution and register renaming and things like that so that we don't have to deal with exactly this case. But this is like a, a simple example which you can easily understand. So there's a data dependency between those two instructions and there's a data dependency between the, the last two instructions. Before you think that this is a toy example, at the level of the Pentium 1, this is a problem and this will just cause you stalls. And fixing it in the way that we propose, which is to swap the middle two to be in this order, means that we will get two instructions running at the same time and then again two instructions running at the same time. So we've taken this program and taken it from one, two, three instructions of time and running it in two. So our program became faster by doing the exact same work in a different order. Yeah, and so that's just one um, possible application of instruction scheduling that gets way more complicated because in um, modern CPUs especially, instructions take different amounts of time. So you need to understand how long is this instruction going to take? Uh, if I reorder things, can I make sure I'm doing as much work as possible while this is calculating? Um, can I make the most use of my pipeline and the parallelism which is kind of intrinsic to the processor. So the big thing at this point is that we're using registers, which is relatively fast, and we're waiting on instruction latency. The biggest latencies we get now are some instruction latencies for really complicated instructions, but mostly memory latency. So we'll try to move memory loads up front as far as we can, especially those that have dependent memory loads, so that we get the best performance out of our memory, and then we'll just hope that everything else will be as fast as possible. Any questions about instruction scheduling before we move on? Cool. Register allocation. I actually really like register allocation. Um, a little bit of background before we move into it. Uh, graphs, again. <laughs> so graph coloring is um, applicable in a whole lot of different areas. Uh, and it's essentially, say we have this graph, we have five nodes. They're arranged in this attractive fish shape. And we want to color the graph such that no two joined nodes have the same color. So we can't have green connected to green. That's, that's right out. This is a nice challenge to print out and give to your kids. They love coloring and they love colors. And this is actually teaching them something useful. So in case we try to color this with five colors, I can paint this with red, green, blue, orange, and yellow. And that would be a perfectly fine graph coloring using five colors. I can try to do it with four which would be like red, green, blue, yellow, and blue again. I can do it with three, and I can do it with two. But if I try to color this with one color, I would have to connect two things with the same color, which is not allowed, which means that this graph can only be colored by two or more colors. Like this. Yeah. So we can color this one green, these two blue, purple, depending on how you look at it, and these two green. So now we have nothing adjoined which has the same color, and we're all good. So this is the minimal coloring of this graph. And um, we can also say that this is too colored. Uh, it's a, a commonly used term is k-coloring. Can I k-color this graph? Can I color this with two colors, three colors, four colors? So this is too colored. I cannot one color it. Back to our interference graph. Uh, sorry, our um, liveness analysis. I said this was coming handy later. So we can take our analysis, which we did earlier, this is just copy pasted over, and we can build what's called an interference graph. So we can look and see that we have this A and B, A, C, C, D, these are live at the same time. That means they have to be um, available at the same time. We can't reuse a register or something there's no way of getting around this. They have to be alive. We have to be available. So anything which has to be available at the same time, we draw a line between. And this is called an interference graph. So just for completeness, because we have a slightly simplified example, in case there would be three letters in here, say A, B, and C, then this would result in three edges being generated between A and B, between A and C, and between B and C. In case you have seven things alive, that would generate a whole giant mess of tangle. Yep, so we can take this aside and we can color it. And hey, we can color this with two colors. So this means we only need two registers. 
because we can we know that A and D do not have to be alive at the same time, and neither do C and B. So if we rewrite our code, we can see we just use R0 and R1. This is nice. We only use two registers for something which had four variables. But what if we take these two instructions here and flip them around? Now, A, D, and C are all used around the same time. They have to be alive. So we have to add an edge to our graph, and now we need another color. And this might be fine, but maybe we only have two registers. Now we need to decide what to do. And the answer is what's called spilling, which is we take one of these, say D, and we put it on the stack, because we don't have enough registers. Um, and there's a whole lot of analysis, analysis which will go into saying, what's the cost of spilling this versus this? How often is it used? All of this kind of stuff feeds back into register allocation. But this is essentially what it's doing. It's a graph coloring problem. Target specific optimizations, we have... We have a simple instruction. So this is at the end of our main function, we're returning zero. So we have a register for returning things, which is EAX or RAX, and we're going to set it to zero. We can do that by just moving the value zero into EAX. And that, as an instruction, is B8 for moving into EAX, and then a whole bunch of zeros, because it's a 32-bit literal. So this is five bytes of, of, of code. I don't like things being that large. Five bytes is huge, especially if you do that at every function where you return an int in your entire program. If we can cut this down to three or two, that would be so much better. Now, there's a trick we can use because we are moving into a register. But we don't need to move, we can XOR it with itself. In the case we take a value, we XOR it with itself, then we take all the places where there's a difference and make them a one. And all the places where they're equal, we make them zero. Now, the register compared with itself will be always guaranteed to be equal, so everything will become zero. So in a really complicated about way, we're just moving zero into the register by using a different instruction. And if we do that, we XOR RAX with RAX, which is one prefix for making a 64-bit instruction, 31 for XOR, and then C0 say it's RAX and RAX. But this is still three bytes. And there's an x86-specific instruction that says if you're doing something to EAX, it will clear the top bytes of RAX. So and what's the relationship case, between RAX and EAX? Yes. So on x86, we have a 32-bit register called EAX, and we have a 64-bit register called RAX. And they are basically the same register, except that RAX is the full 64-bit register, and EAX is the bottom 32 bits. And what they've done in their definition of the language is that if you do something to the bottom 32 bits, the top will be set to zero, so you can use it as 64 bits immediately. So that allows us to do something clever, which is to just not do this on a 64-bit version, but on the 32-bit version. And if we do that, we drop a byte. Poof. Same instruction, one byte less. So now we have the same thing in two bytes. We save three bytes. Yeah, this could be like thousands, millions of places in our program. We could have just saved nine million bytes yeah. or something. Yeah, that, that's the thing. It's saving three bytes, which sounds insanely complicated for saving three bytes out of 32 gigabytes. But if you think about it, this is three bytes in every place that we could be putting zero into a register, which will be happening in millions of times in many programs. So this instruction optimization actually saves a whole lot of space. So then we need to output our assembly. So we'll start with the same stuff we had before. We have a function in IR. We have a stack frame setup. We have a string hello world. We have a call to puts. We remove stack frame and return zero. Well, the first thing that we see is that we have a string, and strings are huge at assembly level. So we don't like them being part of an instruction. We can't put them in. They're, they're too big. So we'll take hello world, and we'll put it into a different bit, and we'll call that hello, which is a string hello world. And now R0 is the offset of hello. But having just the offset there and R0, we'll need to put this into actual x86 instructions. So we'll say we'll move RDI with the offset of hello and then we'll call puts with an implicit RDI, which is the first parameter. Now, given that that's implicit and we are not using R1, we can just remove the implicit bit and remove assigning to R1, we'll just call puts. Okay, well that's looking pretty assembly already. Now we have a stack frame. We'll set up a stack frame by subtracting a bit from RSP, which is our stack pointer, by basically saying these eight bytes are for us. 
So we'll subtract 8 from, our, from a sec pointer. In the place where we restored, we put the 8 back, so we give back the sec space that we allocated, and that's it. And then all the way at the end, we take our return 0, and given that we have a return instruction that doesn't contain a value, we'll just put it into our uh, EAX. So we'll take the instruction we just optimized and then return. Collapse it a little bit. And there's a Godbolt link that shows that this is exactly what your compiler outputs. We didn't cheat at any point. We just transformed everything all the way from the top, all the way to the bottom. You can go to Godbolt to check exactly what it does. Yep, so that is exactly what your compiler is doing. And after we have compiled it, we need to assemble and link and that's all we're going to get to for um, this talk, because we have 15 minutes left. Um, 15? Yeah. Ah, OK, we're going to be going a bit faster. So we take our string. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're only at slide 178. We have so many more to go. <laughs> so we take our string, hello world. We convert it into bytes, which is hello world with a zero at the end. <laughs> then we're going to take all the instructions and poof, instructions. This is just the byte encoding of those instructions. But there's question marks. I can't put question marks in my bytecode. It doesn't work that way. It works that way in the movie Hackers, but not in real life. <laughs> so we'll just mark them as this, this first thing is hello, and the second thing is puts. But we'll, we'll just remember that we need to put it there at some point. So let's remove all the annotation. These are the bytes we have. We have some that we need to do something with. We're going to put them into a, yes, we have a relocation. I tried this before three times, and I keep forgetting this. <laughs> OK, so this bit where we say these four bytes need to be going to hello, this is a relocation. We have some bytes. And at some offset in the bytes, we need to know these four bytes need to be removed and then replaced with whatever actually is hello. But at this point, we're just going to ignore it for now and just condense it down. These are the bytes that we have. The top bit is text. It's read-only stuff. We, it's data. We don't execute it. We'll put it into read-only data. The second bit is executable code. We'll put it into .text. So there we go. Now we have to take back the stuff that we sort of remember. Does everybody still remember what stuff we had? So we had three, three symbols. We had hello, main, and puts. Hello is in read-only data. Main is in text. All, both are at offset zero. And we have puts, except that we don't have puts. But that's fine. We'll just put it in the object file that we don't know. And then we have two relocations. The first one is at five bytes, which says, over there in those four zeros, we should be putting the four bytes signed offset to hello. And in the other one, on 10 bytes in, we should be putting a four byte signed offset pointing to puts. And four bytes signed offset is a human description. So we have a computerish description in ELF that says, this is a RX64, X86, 64 PC32 relocation. But just put hello there. So that's our object file. And now we're going to put that into the linker. So we're going to go right back to where we left off. We take this, and we have all the symbols. No, we don't have all the symbols. We, we are missing puts. So let's go and look through all our libraries where puts might be. And who, who would know puts is actually in puts.o in libc. So we'll take that object file. We load its text segment, and we'll load the symbol table. And the symbol table says puts is at offset 0 in this object file. Somebody put it in this O file. That's easy. So we'll take the text, and we'll just take out that text and just put it right at the end of ours. And put in the symbol table, we now have puts in dot text offset 15 hex. OK, we have all the symbols we need. We're ignoring the stuff in puts that's more relocations because it's just going to take way more time. So now we have everything. We can relocate. So we're going to take everything and say we're going to put this at 804800. Just everything in one big blob of bytes. So we have the first section, which is at that address, plus zero. The second one is at that address, plus the length of a string, plus zero. And the third one is at the address of main, plus the length of main. So now we can take all of this and do some mathematics and just poof, we have numbers. We know exactly where everything's going to be. We know that this relocation needs to point to that number. So we're going to do hex mathematics and get offsets. So we take those offsets, shove them into the bytecode just by putting them in as bytes. And that's our relocation done. So now we have essentially a program that is complete and ready to run. So we can forget about hello and put, because we don't need them. We just need main. And we'll take our program executable, make a prog uh, program table, uh, put in information that says these are bytes, load them into that address, jump to that offset, and we are running. 
We'll forget how, uh, main even. We don't need a symbol table. And we have an executable. Which means we finally get to the point where we can say dot slash hello. And what does that do? Ah, hello world. We both did it. <laughs> ah. Hello world. Hey. 